and thank you for the invitation to present our work today. Um, the second part of my title is a bit tongue in cheek, but hopefully you'll see what I mean when we get through it. So I didn't, really don't need to explain to this audience um, just how much the gut microbiota can influence brain function. Um, and we've seen this in different psychological and neurological um, conditions now, including anxiety, depression. And my own particular interest is in neuroinflammation and neurodegenerative disease. And we know there's probably about four main routes of microbial to host communication. Um, we have the, the vagal and the sympathetic nerves and the um, connections between the enteric and the central system. There's immune modulation and changes through the immune system, the modulation of enteroendocrine hormone regulation um, and the various hormones that move from the gut up to the brain to controlling satiety and feeding and things like that. And the pathway that I'm most interested in, which are the microbe derived metabolites that enter the circulation. And um, we know there's at least 200 different microbial derived metabolites floating around in our blood at any one time. We know far less about what they do and how they can influence um, the brain. And that's basically what my group's looking at. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about the dietary methylamines, which are a particular group of um, metabolites. And these are produced by microbe and host co-metabolism of choline and L-carnitine. And um, the two that I'm going to look at the most in this talk are trimethylamine or TMA and trimethylamine N-oxide, TMAO. And these are produced, um, as I said, from choline and carnitine and fish and meat and things like that contain a lot of these um, products. Microbes will metabolize choline um, into TMA. Um, TMA is then taken up by the portal vasculature into the host liver, where the flavin monooxygenase is converted into TMAO. And TMAO moves into the circulation. Actually, so does TMA. There is a, a TMA and TMAO in the whole circulation. And the reason that we're interested in these is there's a lot of evidence now linking TMAO um, in population studies and epidemiological studies with a lot of cardiovascular diseases. There's far less that's looked at the brain vascular system and particularly the blood brain barrier, um, which is the main interface between the blood and the brain. And that's where we decided to have a look and see if, if TMAO and TMA did anything to those. So we started off using some in vitro models and um, using a, a human cerebral microvascular endothelial cell line, the HCMACD3s. And these cells, we grow them in a monolayer. They have a lot of barrier type characteristics. They, they um, have high electrical resistance. They have um, a permeability bar barrier. They express the tight junctions. They, they mimic a lot of things that you see in the blood brain barrier in, in real life. And the first experiments we did were to expose the cells to TMA or TMAO um, and to look at the paracellular permeability to a, a protein sized tracer. Normally, this tracer doesn't really get in across the endothelium, it, it's, it's blocked. If we expose it to TMA, um, you get a dose dependent increase in permeability of this tracer. So it's moving, the, the barrier is no longer functioning as well. Um, and the, the, the values I've circled in red are roughly speaking the physiological sort of range that you see both of these metabolites at. TMAO, on the other hand, suppresses um, transfer of this, um, this um, tracer across the endothelium. So it's actually in enhancing the blood-brain barrier integrity um, at physiological concentrations. When you give it at very high concentrations, um, probably higher than you would see in normal physiology, um, then it starts to have detrimental effects and, and you see sort of this u-shaped curve where um, different doses have different effects we we're very interested in this we wanted to look at well, what's going on why are these um two really quite similar molecules having quite dramatically different effects and we did some initial bioinformatic analysis looked at gene expression in these endothelial cell lines and saw that both uh, molecules caused some changes in gene expression when we do the pathway analysis and all the signaling pathway analysis that's actually explained in a lot more detail in the paper that I've got the reference at the bottom, we saw basically two things, that TMAA, TMA sorry, seemed to activate cellular stress response pathways, whereas TMAO regulated the cytoskeleton and act in bundle formation. And the reason we think this is important is tight junctions between endothelial cells and the blood-brain barrier work by being tethered to the cytoskeleton and holding the cells close together. So we looked at um, F-actin distribution using phylloidin staining. And here we have untreated cells and you have this really nice sort of peripheral localization of most of the F-actin in the cell, sort of around the junctions between the cells. If you're exposed to TMA, this is really quite disrupted. 
Um, you get stress fibers moving across, you get very jaggedy um, interaction between the cells. You even start to see the cells pulling away from each other, which is probably why you see these permeability deficits. TMAO, on the other hand, seem to strengthen the ex expression of um, F-actin around the outside of the cell. And if anything, seems to be promoting its function. We then sort of concentrated more on TMAO because that seemed to be the more interesting thing and to actually think, well, how's it working? How is it doing this? And one of the genes that we noticed it was upregulating was a protein called anexin-1. And anexin-1 caught our interest because a long time ago we've shown that this is a major regulator of tight junctions at the blood-brain barrier. And TMAO seems to cause release of anexin-1 from the endothelial cells into their medium in culture. Um, and we know that anexin-1 acts as an, an autocrine paracrine feedback mechanism um, and can stimulate tight junction formation um, after its release from the cell. So this was all very positive. If we block anexin-1 by um, actions by either knocking it down with a short hairpin RNA, um, we, just, we can prevent the effects of TMAO. So in a wild type cell, TMAO is reducing permeability to a tracer not affected by a scramble sequence, but as we steadily knock down more and more of the annexin-1, you lose the protective effect of TMAO. You see an increase in permeability, but that's, that's to be expected because we're knocking out this protein that does regulate the blood-brain barrier and does regulate tight junction. But the more important point from our point of view is that TMAO doesn't work any longer. Um, and as an alternative to that, we also put in an antagonist to the receptor for annexin-1, um, and again, this antagonist blocks the effects of TMAO. So it seems to, TMAO seems to be working through an exin one to promote blood-brain barrier um, function. And this is all great, but that's all in vitro and just in cell lines. And we wanted to see, well, does that actually really happen in vivo? So we switched to a, an animal model and used mice. Um, and we used a very classic model of blood-brain barrier permeability where you inject the mice with Evans blue. And this dye binds to albumin and essentially turns the entire mouse blue, except for the brain and the spinal cord. It doesn't get into the brain tissue. If you inject the mouse with TMAO at a, a dose that should roughly double um, circulating levels, you immediately see a reduction in even the small fraction of Evans blue that gets into the brain is reduced. So you're tightening the blood brain barrier. And then this sort of tails off with almost the same kinetics that you see TMAO being excreted from the animals. That's fine, that's in a, a baseline condition. We also wanted to challenge the animals. So we gave them a peripheral injection of LPS with a dose that we know causes um, an increase in blood-brain barrier permeability, you can see here. And again, giving TMAO after view given the LPS, we can block the permeabilization. So we're restoring blood-brain barrier function. And so we can see that TMAO is enhancing baseline blood-brain barrier integrity and seems to be reversing inflammation-induced permeability damage. Again, this is an acute model. You don't classically get exposed to acute um, bolus doses of TMAO in real life. What happens when you have it at a more chronic, sort of reflective of the dietary type of administration that you would normally see? So in this case, we switched to another model where we gave TMAO in the drinking water um, over a two-month period. So they, the mice are continuously exposed to TMAO. And we combined it with a, a model of inflammation that doesn't cause an acute inflammatory response that you can see in any sort of behavioral or immune cell phenotype, um, but we know that does have effects on cognition. And it's a very subchronic, low level um, inflammation. And then we exposed these animals to this model for two months and looked at their cognition and their blood brain barrier. And the first thing we want to look at was blood brain barrier extravasation. So here, these are. Um, zoomed in pictures of um, blood vessels that are, isolated, uh, that are defined by the isolectin B4 staining in the brain. And we looked at IgG deposition. So you have IgG floating around in the serum all the time, but it shouldn't get into the brain tissue. As you can see in the water-treated animals, there's, there's no essentially no IgG. This isn't affected by TMAO treatment. If you give LPS, you suddenly start to see these deposits of IgG on the inside of the blood vessels. So they've moved into the brain parenchyma. They, which it shouldn't really be doing. It's suggesting the barrier is leaky to an extent. And this is completely reversed by TMAO treatment or prevented by TMAO treatment, so which strongly suggests that the TMAO is actually protecting the blood-brain barrier in vivo over a long time point, as well as the acute studies we looked at earlier. The other aspect that we wanted to see, well, does this have any 
meaning for cognition because the, the ultimate function of the brain is cognition and control of um, the sort of thought and memory and motor function and things like that. So we um, used that same chronic model and examined both the open field test, um, looking at anxiety and motor function, and the Y maze looking at spatial memory and saw no real effects at all. But when we moved to the novel object recognition memory, we did see something. And in this test, the mouse is placed in a cage with two objects, two identical objects, they get familiar to them. You then replace one of the objects with a new one, and a normal mouse will spend more time looking at that new object, um, both as sort of a combination of this is new, this is interesting, and also they, they remember that this isn't something they've seen before. If the mice have been treated with LPS in the same subacute, very, very low level dose, they lose their interest in that novel object. They don't spend any more time looking at the novel one than at the, um, the familiar one, either because they, they don't care any longer or their memory isn't working properly and they don't recognize that it's new. And TMAO treatment could prevent that. So again, TMAO is protecting cognition from this inflammatory damage. The last thing I wanted to, we looked at was what's actually happening in the brain tissue of these animals. And um, we looked particularly at astrocytes and also microglia, which I'm not going to show in this talk, but did something very similar. Um, and we looked in the entorhinal cortex, which is an area of the brain we know is involved in recognition memory. And animals exposed to LPS, the astrocytes there had changed the morphology quite dramatically. They'd sort of um, pulled in all their processes. They'd become a lot more amoeboid-like. -like. Um, and this is a classic example, a classic um, finding that other people have shown as well. When you give, um, you activate astrocytes with LPS, they take on this morphology. And that morphology is completely prevent. That change is prevented by TMAO treatment. So it's protecting um, the entorhinal astro um, cortex astrocytes from actually being in, um, inactivated. The really quite surprising thing was the hippocampus, which is literally next door to the entorhinal cortex, but it's much more involved in spatial memory. It's totally unaffected by either LPS or TMAO. So it's a very region specific effect of TMAO on these particular astrocytes that has direct um, implications for cognition and cognitive function. So to summarize what I've talked about, we show that um, methylamines derived by processing of dietary components by the bugs can actually modify blood-brain barrier integrity in vitro and in vivo. TMAO seems to be working through an exin one and cytoskeletal modification and, and sort of protects and enhances um, the brain vascular um, barrier function and protects from the inflammation and the cognitive consequences of inflammation. And this we think might be quite important in when it comes to sort of the effects of a seafood rich diet on neurological health. We know that eating fish is good for your brain and known for a long time and everybody's always thought that's due to omega-3 fatty acids and things like that. This suggests there may actually be more to it than that and that actually TMAO may also be playing a role. Um, and the idea that TMAO is just detrimental to cardiovascular health probably is a, a bit of an oversimplification and actually what matters is is the dose, is, is what else is going on in your body at the same time. And it's probably more complicated than we started to look at. And this is where I'm being a bit tongue in cheek and saying it's neither good nor bad. It depends on your dose. It depends on your exposure. But I think we need to think a little more complicated than just one molecule doing one thing. It's 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 interesting. And I just want to finally um, finish by acknowledging the people who did the work with me, particularly Leslie Hoyles at Nottingham Trent University and David Fazor at Norwich Medical School um, and all the other collaborators and funders. Um, and thank you very much for listening.